Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Teresa Campbell with PIA MidAmerica, and you have joined the APAN Wage and Benefits Analysis and Trends webinar. Note that all of our attendees are placed in mute mode during this session to ensure a quality recording. However, we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen, and we ask that you communicate technical difficulties in the chat field. Um, Ben and Janie will be helping monitor those boxes so that we can address any problems that you have. The wage and benefit annual survey and reports are, are a coordinated effort by APAN association leaders across the country. They guide the programs and content to gather relevant statistics to assist members in their labor management practices. The focus is around regional comparisons, company size, and industry segments. Now today, Rick Reescraft with LB Carlson will be presenting with me, and we also have a few members logged on as co-hosts to contribute as well. Let's get started. For those of you who are not familiar with the Wage and Benefits Survey, we're going to take you through a quick report overview, how we gather the data, how it's grouped together, and then jump into some of the analysis comparing year over year and region to region where we found some insights and trends. And Rick is gonna join me in talking about those trends and potential solutions for those on the call. Um, these are the 15 print associations nationwide that have a rich history dating back to the 1800s. They've been doing these reports since the 1970s um, and are each engaged with the, the extensive data that's collected. Um, I wanna thank LB Carlson, who is our 2023 Wage and Benefit Survey and Reports sponsor. They've also been the sponsor for the last couple of years. It is um, imperative that we have a little bit of support because of the amount of effort that it takes to build the database and manage the, um, the information and reports. So thank you to LB Carlson. Okay, so a quick report overview. If you have not seen these reports, um, this year's reports are the images that are across the bottom. Um, it is the most extensive and reliable year-to-year -year management report in the graphics industry. I mentioned that, that it goes back to the 1970s and with over 400 companies participating and 190 data points each year, um, it's a lot of information. There are over 200 industry positions and job descriptions and the full reports, of course, are by region and company size and industry segments that are broken out for packaging, tag, and label, digital printers, in-plant printers, and union forms. Uh, we also did a sales compensation survey last year and are committed to doing that every two to three years. It's much more uh, complicated when you look at lots of different sales compensation styles. So that is available to you as well. Um, each region has their own custom report that focuses on their area and then compares that to the other areas. So you would have your APAN logo um, on the cover of your report. Now, the format of the reports um, really breaks down comparing um, wages and then comparing benefits. So at the front of the report, you get the um, breakdown of the categories and how it's broken out. So in this case, we're showing you an example of a cutter operator. And then all of the participants um, in this category, there are 105 companies, the average number of employees was 109. And then these highlighted columns um, for average pay and median give you the idea of um, the total average as well as the quartile. So they're showing, we're here showing you the, the lowest point, uh, quartile one, quartile two, um, three quarters of the group, and then P90, which is 90% that reported and below this level. Now it's important that we break that out because if you look here for all participants, the highest reported average for this particular position was $35 and 74 cents. Um, but the 90% were at $27 and four cents. When you're looking at your regional reports, you're gonna get breakout at the top of these columns. So in this case, we're using an example from our sister association in the South. 
um, and comparing them with the rest of the country. So this is important. You're seeing North Central here, and that's where that highest wage was coming from. But when you compare it to PIA of the South, um, their highest was, was considerably uh, different, $27. Okay. If we look at the format of the benefits, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> so we've given you what question was asked on the left and then broken it out across by region or by company size. Um, in these cases, an employee count is going to give you um, the number of companies that reported in that area. And then, of course, average sales volume is going to give you a dollar amount here of what they were contributing. So those in the West had a lower average sales volume really than across the other areas of the country. The rest of these numbers are really showing you in a percentage. So companies that have a written drug-free work, workplace policy, almost 69% of them in the Northeast, um, and then it jumps to 83% in the North Central region. So that's significant. It goes on through employee handbooks and job descriptions and testing for drugs and alcohol. And I will get to a, a description of comparing those regions for drugs and alcohol, but you can see here 71% um, in, in the North Central region and 38% in the West. So where it, it becomes more significant or more important. Okay, now you would need to know what those regions are that are broken out so that you know what states are in there. And this is at the beginning of the reports as well. So you can see what we're actually grouping together for South Central would be Arkansas, Kansas, Louisiana, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas, and so forth. Okay, so one other important thing, a lot of data. It is broken out by salary versus hourly. So we grouped um, those salary positions and put them under a category called management so that you can see that these are annual salaries versus those that are hourly wages um, being reported at an hourly uh, wage here at the bottom. So in this case, um, if we're looking at all positions for an estimator, the lowest point was $30,000, but the average was $60,000. If we come down here to the inserter machine operator, the lowest was $10, but the average was $17.83. And then if you go across here, that highest point was $31. All right. So that's really explaining how they work. If we look at wages by region instead of um, versus company size, region is going to give you the comparison across the region. And then company size is broken down in, into companies that are one to 25 employees, 26 to 75 76 to 150 and then larger than 150. So you get this all participants rate averaging um, across the board, and then you're able to compare it to, to your company size in that grouping as well. Now, benefits by region versus company size, again, is a little bit different. Here at the top, you're looking at by region. So paid leave provided by company 75% of them in the 76% in the Northeast um, are offering paid leave. Uh, if we come down here and look at this, a similar comparison, uh, we'll look at health insurance. A PPO sponsored plan is, is offered and it's ranging from 53 to 73%, a pretty wide scale. Um, and down here by company size, you see it's a little more consistent um, depending on the size of the company. So you have a lot of data to compare when we come across there, um, even at the bottom here where there's no pl health plan offered, um, very few percentage, not even 1% not offering it, but that jumps to uh, nearly 14% in the Southeast. And then interesting enough, down here for number of employees, it's about 14% in our smallest group of companies versus those that are getting larger. Uh, when you see two stars like this, it's telling you that we didn't have enough data to give you an accurate 
average. So we needed more participants in that group to actually provide that analysis. Okay, if we jump into the analysis, this is the part where um, we want to look at those comparisons. The first few slides here are really year over year comparison, a three year trend. Um, here we're showing the average employee count for uh, one to 25 employees with the blue bar across the bottom, 26 to 75 uh, with the red bar and, and so forth. And so when we look at the number of companies that participated, we have we had more participation on the high level for number of companies, but the rest seem to be very consistent from year to year um, in number of companies. Um, just a slight dip here for our largest companies over 150 employees where two years ago they were well over 300 and they're dropping down to about 250. Interesting trend that smaller needs to seem to be decreasing versus the rest remaining steady. Um, here, when we look at average employee count and a three-year trend comparison by region, North Central and South Central actually saw increases. Northeast and the West saw decreases, but the most significant was Southeast with a drop of about 124 employees to 59 on average. Um, however, the average across the country um, increased by 10 employees in all categories. Now this, I have to say, um, we don't have the data to compare the exact contributors from year to year. So it may be an anomaly that we had a different uh, data set, different group of companies participating from the Southeast uh, this year than we did in years past. Definitely something to consider. Um, all right, if we move to year over year compensation, um, increase averages. This, I think, is a very interesting slide. Of course, these are annual salaries, uh, but you see here where we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, 2022 had a very large increase, um, an average of 2.5, um, and then back down to 1.6. So it's still trending upward, and that's important as we look at how we manage labor costs. If we look at hourly workers, year over year compensation, it too is increasing uh, a much bigger jump in 2022. Uh, we saw that across the board for manufacturing where it went from 3% to an average of 7% and then dropping down to 1.6% this year. Um, so below $22 an hour and nearly $24 an hour in 2023. Okay, um, when we look at Rick, no, okay. When we looked at projected wage adjustments and we asked what their wage adjustment would be by region, it was 2.74%. Um, and by company size, it was 2.7. So very, very close versus uh, those that adjusted wages in the last 12 months for existing staff to match new hires. So you see a large amount, 85% adjusting um, for very, very large companies. But when you look at it by region, um, our members in the West had the lowest percentage of, of adjusting wages. Now, we all know that, that um, to recruit employees, they had to be hired in at a higher wage, and then all companies had to go back and look at their existing staff. Again, a major part of managing labor cost. So what's to come? When we looked at the November federal jobs report, it showed an average hourly wage up 4% over the last 12 months. Um, so that's interesting because the numbers in our industry are less. Um, however, employment and manufacturing decreased slightly in October. The average hourly earnings for employees on private non-farm payrolls rose 7 cents or 0.2% to $34 an hour. If we go back and look at that previous slide, our industry average was $23.86 an hour. So we are nearly $10 or more below the national average. That's important when we think about competing against automotive or HVAC to try and recruit workers that are mechanically inclined and they're being 
recruited away to other jobs starting out. Um, it does look like nationally the wage increases have leveled off. Um, the unemployment rate is at 3.9%, but total employment rose by 150,000 jobs. All right, back to our industry. When we look at trends in wages over that three-year period for department managers. Now, these are managers in production um, and their average salary. Some of them had a significant spike in 2022. Um, Pre-press managers, maintenance, um, digital print managers, mailroom, uh, workflow managers at the top there. And it appears to be leveling off um, slightly in 2023. I definitely want to encourage you all to jump in. I don't want to run through this too quickly. So if there's something that we're covering that doesn't make sense, please um, feel free to, to ask a question or interrupt or make a comment. Okay. When we go back to 2020, we saw positions with the largest increases um, in a few areas, and that was customer service managers, human resource managers, marketing and business development managers, and sales managers or sales VPs. They had an average increase um, from 20 to 20, 2021 of 9%, um, which was really high. And that appears to be somewhat um, leveling off as well, as you can see here. Um, it is not surprising to us that we saw these type of positions with the increase as we came out of the pandemic. Uh, certainly human resource managers became uh, a need that everybody had because of the, the labor challenges and so forth that were happening in manufacturing. Um, but if we go to the next slide, we show the second group, which is sheet fed press operators. Um, this is no surprise to any of you. Everybody is looking for a skilled sheet fed press operator, and there are fewer and fewer uh, with experience to be had. The average increase to 20 from 20 to 21 uh, was 12%. And then I've broken it down here for you by press size. So if we're looking at really large 61 to 81 inch wide presses, they actually had a bit of a decrease in 2022 and then back up where all these others um, continue to um, increase hourly wages across the board. Um, and so here's that $32 an hour that we saw in an earlier slide. Interesting enough, uh, flexo operators have a similar um, issue with sheet fed press operators. So 20 to 21, the average increase was 14%. And those two um, appear to be somewhat leveling off. This one here at the bottom, Forms Collider Operator had a significant spike in the last year, but it too was at the bottom in terms of hourly wage. So just above $21 an hour last year and jumping to $24, 20, $24 an hour in 2023. Um, interesting enough, we've seen many commercial operations starting to diversify and they've added flexo to their um, offerings as well. So there's been a blend or a mix there across the board. Okay, this is the other area that we saw um, a significant increase and that is finishing, converting, um, mail fulfillment, warehouse and maintenance operators uh, with the largest increase from 20 to 21 at 8% on an average, and they appear to be uh, somewhat leveling off as well. Um, so you hear, you see that male specialist position um, at the highest peak in 2022, and then dropping down slightly. We'll talk a little bit about these trends uh, when we get to the analysis um, portion of what this all means. All right. If we move to benefits, one of the biggest areas that we saw, we saw continuing to spike is the shift differential. We measured that shift differential uh, both by dollar increase as well as percentage. So the green is 
third shift and getting individuals to work on third shift um, has jumped um, here in dollar amount um, as well as second shift. So much more difficult to get workers um, on second and third shift. When we look at that maximum shift dip, dip, differential percentage, you see again that spike um, significant in 2023, where it was really fairly consistent from 21 to 20, 2022. And so these are averages up the side, both jumping to 25% to get people to work on a second or a third shift. That definitely is impacting uh, labor costs and managing those costs. Okay, if we think about that and we compare it to the number of production shifts that are out there across the region, what we saw here, um, the, the region with the strongest um, area of one production shift is, is obviously here, the Southeast. And then of course they have the lowest um, for, for third shifts. North Central is the largest for companies with a second and third shift. Um, but the fewest with only one shift. Uh, the Northeast and the South Central regions offer the most balance for those three shifts. So if we're looking at how do we get people to work those shifts or how do you expand your capacity, we need to look at adding those second or third shifts and what's the cost to do that? How does that compare across the regions in our country? Now, interesting enough, we talked a little bit about drug policy Earlier, um, nearly 80% of all companies surveyed nationwide have a written drug policy, um, but very few test at random. Interesting uh, to note that nearly half um, tested new workers and a quarter tested in the event of an accident. How does this impact each of our regions, particularly as uh, marijuana becomes legal in many states across the country. We thought that this was an interesting statistic when we compare jury duty, voting, and parental leave by region. Um, certainly the vast majority offer pay time off for jury duty, um, but less than half offer pay time off for voting. Uh, paid parental leave is in that 25% quartile. And of course, that's not just mothers, it's fathers as well. Perks like this are things that our industry has to think about as we compete with other manufacturing industry that are offering uh, rich benefits. When we look at those incentives, one of the options is do we offer a three-day, a four-day, a five-day work week? Uh, of course, more than 70% reported a predominant five-day work week, why less than 15% offered a four-day work week um, only in the Northeast, South Central, and Southeast regions. Uh, North Central, Northeast, and South Central were the only regions offering three-day work weeks with 10% or less. So when you look here in the West, we didn't have anyone reporting that um, they were offering three-day or four-day options in the West as compared to Southeast or other regions. All right, overtime pay, another one of those incentives that we have to consider. Um, the vast majority have a policy of overtime being paid after 40 hours worked, only 25% or less um, offering overtime after 40 hours are earned and very few paying overtime upon shift completion uh, policy. But when we look at other manufacturing industries, they are growing in um, offering overtime based on shift completion. So th something to consider. <clears throat> this is looking at overtime pay. And most firms pay time and a half for Saturdays and holiday work um, with double time being reported at 35% or less of the survey participants. Um, you don't see a lot of jump from one region to the other. You see here in the West, um, we did not have any paying double time on Sunday uh, versus other areas where it was higher in the Northeast. Now, I gave you a lot of data here on vacation policy. Um, really, the average is about 
35% of respondents providing one week of paid vacation after one year of service, with the strongest being in the South Central region and the weakest being in the Northeast. Uh, less than 15% offering one week of vacation after six months or two weeks paid vacation after one year. However, 25% offer three weeks vacation after five years or other vacation policies. So again, here, how do we compare? Um, it's interesting that we had a drop in employee count in the South Central region and that they are very high on the charts here for offering an incentive of one week vacation after one year. Um, we wondered if those statistics may be impacting one or the other. And then we looked at PTO accumulation. So um, do they allow for their employees to carry over uh, PTO days? And in our industry, um, it's consistently low across the region. Most uh, companies reported that they don't allow PTO accumulation. However, for those that do, the average maximum number of hours accumulated were over 600 hours in the Northeast and the Southeast uh, with the other regions well below 200 hours. So there's this is where you see these off the charts. Again, um, is, is this a perk to try and recruit employees in the Southeast? Health insurance is a tough one, <clears throat> something that we look at all the time and trying to manage that cost while you're competing against other industry companies as well as other manufacturing industries. Um, in this case, across the nation, more than 65% of our industry sponsored a PPO healthcare plan. However, we found it interesting that here in the West, they um, had 50% also offering HMO plans. Um, and that was significantly lower in the other industries with that green bar. Um, less than 20% supported a self-funded plan. That doesn't surprise us with the average size of employee count in our industry. And 15% or less did not offer a health care plan at all. So at 15%, those, those organizations are struggling to compete with others that do offer a plan. The Southeast reported the highest percentage without a health care plan where the West was zero. So there's no orange bar here. Everyone that reported was offering a health care plan. Interesting. Okay, health insurance average percentage covered by the employer. Um, wow, when looking at these numbers, the West really leads the country with a large margin while the Southeast um, fell below all of the others. North Central and Northeast and South Central, of course, were similar to each other here. Um, and these are measuring employee plus one, employee plus child, employee plus family, or employee only. Um, employee only, of course, is the highest um, in most, except for South Central. When we look at average monthly premium, um, it seems that the average employee plus one in the West was the highest. Um, over here on your, your left is the dollar amount playing, paying over $3,000 um, for average monthly premium um, and the rest of the country um, lower. The, North, the premiums were uh, nearly double in the West followed by the Northeast compared to other regions here. Cost sharing, of course, is a way for our firms to be able to manage that expense. Uh, when we have a majority of low firms in the industry, their health insurance um, is more costly than other manufacturing industries that have larger organizations. When you look here, um, firms cost sharing with their employees for an employee plus one versus the other options was significantly more here in the Southeast. These two on the bottom right of each column are those offering 100% coverage for um, dental and vision. Now, there's a lot more detail to this. Um, the maximum percentage and the minimum percentage and a fixed cost comparison are provide, provided in the detailed reports. Those are all going to help you to decide 
uh, what kind of healthcare benefits you offer and how much you can cover versus sharing the cost with your employee. Retirement really focused on companies offering 401k matching programs across the country. That's that blue bar um, with less than 20% having no retirement plan at all. And so clearly um, recruiting requires uh, retirement plans to be offered. Um, profit sharing options were the strongest in the West at nearly 20%. So that's over here in the blue bar. Um, we didn't have any of them reporting in the Southeast, which is an interesting comparison. Okay, so we're trying to recruit those employees to stay with us uh, to be retained, we have to look at job absence and employee turnover. And so this is comparing um, the companies that track it and those that Of all the respondents, only 40% um, tracked employee turnover, which was interesting nationwide with 25 or percent or less tracking job absence. For those that do not track employee turnover, 20% uh, in the North Central region and 15% or less in the other regions. Job absence was also highest in the North Central region um, for those that tracked it at 15% average, while across the regions were 5% or less respectively. So interesting there as well. You wonder if weather may impact that. Lots of data on other incentives. Um, and so what can we do to recruit and retain with incentives um, far and wide across every region? Bonuses were the number one incentive followed by gift cards. Um, remote days were something that, that we measured as well as some of them gave out free branded company gear. So comparing that here, but interesting enough, to, uh, several areas in the West didn't measure at all, didn't report any using those trends. Uh, when you look at free branded company gear versus the South, they're very high in the percentage and the West is um, virtually zero. Okay, I'm gonna ask Rick Reescraft to join us and talk a little bit about how to use those surveys um, and give us an, give us some insight on managing those labor costs. Rick? Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Uh, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, I some of what I'm going to touch on, is you covered a little bit in, in some earlier slides, so uh, but I don't think it's going to be too redundant. But um, I, I've been associated with the Wage and Benefit Survey for many years, um, and, and it, we are a CPA and consulting firm in the graphic arts industry for almost 50 years. And this, this survey has been one of the, the go-to tools um, for, for um, many of our clients, if not most of our clients um, throughout those years as they try to manage um, labor costs. Uh, it, labor is obviously the largest controllable cost, uh, I, not your largest cost, but it's, you know, a paper is obviously the largest cost, but we kind of call it a controllable cost because most of what you, you, you can, you can influence that one way or another with a lot of what you do inside the plant. And so this tool uh, is something that our clients utilize quite often for, for um, the feedback that they need to, to take, uh, make decisions in, across the board in this area. So um, we're using it, uh, we're seeing our clients use it for benchmarking um, year to year for sure. And the last three, four year roller coaster we've been on, it's even more critical that uh, our clients are tuned into what's going on because it's been moving so fast uh, with the pandemic and the post pandemic um, and trying to stay abreast of what where things are going. And I'm going to touch on some of those ongoing issues that are still impacting that roller coaster. Um, so it's it's definitely something that our, our clients use in 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 in, uh, in keeping track of that. Um, you mentioned re retention and recruiting. Um, no doubt, um, hanging on to workers is, is is as critical as recruiting new ones. Um, uh, in this this market has been for uh, since the pandemic started, and and it still is. 
and in, in last year, in fact, we had on this webinar there was a panel of HR uh, folks that um, talked about the new world that they're living in, um, and and I think your survey pointed to um, the compensation levels in that position, for example, going up um, as as those uh, positions and those those roles played a, a key role in trying to. Um, bring uh, labor solutions to our clients. So, so that's that's a very uh, key use that this report brings. Uh, those human resource uh, managers are still dealing with uh, creative ways. I, I was just keeping track of some of the things you were pointing out, Teresa, on shift differential, paid parental leave, work week structure, vacation benefits, all those other incentives you had listed. Um, some of those things weren't even in the survey just it was less four years ago. And so you're seeing a lot of creativity uh, coming to the marketplace um, to try to retain and recruit people and I'll get into some of the reasons why that's happened, obviously. So um, Rick, definitely um, a different strategy in, in years past. Um, the easiest way to grow capacity was to add those second or third shifts on equipment that are, industry already had. Now our members are looking at adding more equipment on first shift because they're struggling to get workers for, for a second or third shift. And that's a definitely a trend that, that has changed. Yeah, for sure. And, and there's definitely, there's for sure an ongoing reason for that. Um, as as um, I'll get into work-life balance issues that are still out there in, in, in the workforce. So um, so those were just, you know, the high level. Those are some of the issues that uh, or the, the survey is used for uh, in our clients. I, I would, you know, love to have people chat in if, you know, any specifics on how they use the wage and benefit surveys. We can we can um, talk about that as those questions or those comments come in. So next slide. Um, some of the I noticed you referenced the the latest um, U.S. jobs report that just came out last week uh, on November, um, and some of the headlines that you read when you're looking at that. It was a positive report. There's no doubt about it. Um, I was looking at the Fortune um, magazine. Uh, I follow a writer in there, and you know it said solid, solid U.S. hiring, low unemployment, latest signs of a a sturdy job market and we went well <laughs> is it sturdy compared to what you know it's it's getting better and so i guess that's what i'm trying to point out it's it's a it, is it returning to normal but um well if normal was pre-pandemic and pandemic was over here we're, we're definitely coming back to our normal but we still have some some big issues to deal with but there are a lot of positives and i was going to go a little deeper into some of the u.s um job report information, if I could, for a minute. Um, um, the positive side is that, that the addition of jobs and the decrease of uh, um, the employment rate, uh, those are two factors that the economists are looking at in particular that have been tracking for a while now that are leading them to believe that there, there's probably going to be a soft landing versus a recession. Now, that's always a risky thing to say, but that when you have a bunch of months strung together, they can start to say that with some some more confidence, um, and and so that that doesn't take recession off the off the table, but it, it definitely shows that we're still getting things under control, and we're we're excuse me we're we're moving in the right direction, and there are no big alarm bells going off. So that 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 to me was a positive, and it, and it does signify then that the job market is getting more stable. The economy is is pretty stable still. Um, um, so the other thing that this points out that even though we're not back to pre-pandemic numbers, uh, the businesses that are hiring, um, they're filling those numbers. Um, they're, they're, they're not filling the same huge um, uh, vacancies that they had before. Uh, people are coming back to work. The unemployment continues to keep, creep down. Um, and so those are all positives, and there's no doubt. Inflation is easy. Um, that that has a positive bearing on the economy, and obviously in, in, indirectly in the labor market. Um, in fact, the the inflation, as we know, was rampant just a, a year year and a half ago. It's coming down 
quite rapidly and in fact is on a, a, a record pace for a, a, an inflation decline. Um, so that's a, that's a positive that's coming out of the, out of the US uh, jobs reports as well. Um, and, the, and the prediction is that they'll, that'll keep cooling um, and that will have some bearing on what the feds do with interest rates. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, uh, so that's that, that's overall that things are heading in the right direction. And 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 but then the labor uh, reports definitely point out some factors that um, it's not all heading in the right direction. Um, the the job market, um, the, the gains of those two hundred thousand dollar jobs that that were were uh, reported in November, most of those jobs were in healthcare. Um, hotels, restaurants, government, um, those those sectors made up almost 100% of the job gains. You, did, you didn't hear the word manufacturing in there. Uh, and I think you pointed out, Teresa, that manufacturing was stagnant or maybe even a slight decline. Um, and and that, that's kind of a trend for the year. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of factors contributing to that, but but is, is, a, is a, it's a segment of the job market or the manufacturers that are are just holding their own and maybe even slightly declining. And, and, and so we have to take that into account, particularly as we look at graphic arts and, and how that's impacting things. Um, so nationally wages are, are growing, um, maybe at a slower pace than they were. Um, it certainly as they recovered from the post pandemic months um, just a year ago, but um, but I did know that you, you your survey points that Printing industry in particular is are below those national trends in in, in uh, so that that begs a question in terms of competing and 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 we're, and we're going to touch on that. I know Teresa and I talked about that a little bit before this call. As 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 you're in the printing industry, I believe you're still looking for skilled workers. They're still hard to find. Um, you, maybe even your 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 ordinary I, I shouldn't say ordinary, but your your uh, lower skilled level hourly wages or hourly positions are, are even harder to find yet still. So some of the things that are causing that we'll get into um, in a second here. So, so I just think that this gap that we're seeing um, is, is still there, particularly manufacturing. We have, I think that U, the US report said that there was 9 million plus job openings in November. Um, and even with a lower unemployment rate, we we only had um, six million people on the on the unemployment rolls, if you will. So even if you filled all the, all the jobs with the, the, all the unemployment went to zero, we're three million short. That sounds like a big number, and it is a big number. Um, but in the pandemic, it, it was closer to five and a half million. Um, so there's there's been a huge progress um, made in in that shortfall. But why is that shortfall still there, and will it go away in the near term? Um, it won't, and you know I wanted to touch on a few of those those reasons. Um, Rick, do you feel like baby boomers retiring early related to COVID and that particular generation moving out of the labor market um, is what will be the new normal? Will we ever return to what was pre-pandemic normal? Yeah, I, uh, no, I, I, I should say, no, we won't return to the, the pre-pandemic normal. And yes, that, that, that retirement, the retiring workers is definitely one of the factors. Um, I, I went to some, some um, economist webinars prior to the pandemic, and they were talking about the, the biggest thing that, that, that we're facing as a country is the demographics of, of our aging population and how that impacts the workforce. And as, as the baby boomers, which was the big bubble of workers, retires and takes themselves out of the workforce, that's just gonna <laughs> cause an issue where, where there's not gonna be enough workers to fill the demand. That was their pre-pandemic and it was accentuate, accentuated during the pandemic because <laughs> people then even took earlier retirements like i'm done with this right you know um and then other factors uh have added to this but that's definitely a factor teresa so well and um as you said pre-pandemic um that was 
always an issue that we were going to face. And I think that uh, many thought that we would respond with automation, with ways to make things more efficient because we knew we weren't going to have those workers. And then, of course, the pandemic uh, brought those challenges forward much faster than anticipated. But even automation is not solving the labor shortage problems. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it definitely, there were certainly some very creative inroads made uh, in, in with technology um, in during the pandemic. Um, this isn't a production one, but we're on this Zoom call, you know, <laughs> that, that was like almost non-existent in terms of uh, how we communicated prior to the pandemic and now it's the norm. Um, but I think, think what, what's going on in your printing plants, there's been a lot of a lot of innovation, a lot of things, but not keeping uh, up with the pace of, of the the gap. Um, and the gap is still there. Um, and and so I don't know if you remember this term. Um, I know I know we talked about it on, on the last probably two annual webinars that we've done on the on the wage and benefit survey. Um, it was called the Great Resignation. You heard that. Um, people were just were done, right? You, and where'd they go? And nobody knew where they went. And 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 part of that was the retiring um, workforce, the early retirements. Part of it was just a lot of people just said, "I'm not doing this." Part of it was obviously the people that had to leave when the, the company shut down, and then said, "I'm not going back to work." There was just a lot going into that. Um, so it, it, the the jobs report highlights that a, a lot of those. Are coming back into the workforce now, but still there was such a giant gap that the that even if they did come back full force, the, the gap will still remain. And 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 there's a there's a new term now that it's kind of taken preference um, to the Great Resignation that is going on. It's called the Great Reshuffle, and I know our printers are seeing this. And and what some of the things you were pointing to allude to this, Teresa, is it's not so much that it, the, the people are not wanting to work it's how they're wanting to work uh, we're seeing um, work-life balance if you will um, take higher precedent um, than it ever has in the past um, and and the to be blunt the, the 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 workers are in the driver's seat with that when, when the gap exists like this so our skilled workers can go across the street into a different industry um, and and get a higher wage and get better perks, better benefits. Um, maybe they're going to the one that's doing the three hour or three day work week. <laughs> you know, it's not a lot of those yet, but some people are doing some creative things here where the mentality of that, that worker that is looking for, give me more free time and pay me more. <laughs> um, it, it, there's, that's a lot of that going on. And so it isn't so much that they've, they've, they quit the workforce and then are never going back to work. But the ones that are coming back in are are, are definitely looking for different things than they used to. And I don't. I think some of your survey um, results are starting to point to that. Um, and that's why I mentioned earlier that the the human resources <coughs> functions of recruiting and retention have to continue to be so um, proactive and, and so engaging. In, in these types of issues um, in, in order to, to com combat that issue, so. And Rick, uh, we were having a conversation earlier today where uh, when you think about our industry compared to other industries that they aren't the same, um, other industries are tending to hire in at a higher wage and our industry is hiring at a, at a lower wage, but the opportunity there uh, appears to be much greater. So if you could work to being becoming a press foreman, um, eventually your wage will increase, but we're struggling to recruit those mechanical workers because they're going to HVAC or automotive or other manufacturing areas because the higher in wage is higher. It, it kind of brings us to this question that Ryan has asked. Yeah. Are other benefits offered to employees helping employees employers retain versus increased wages with the newer employee pool? And um, this slide that you have really speaks to that. Yeah, it, it, we it definitely the answer to that question, Ryan, is yes. Um, and, and we're seeing it. 
um, we're seeing a whole different strategy in terms of what what what's happening out there to 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 work through this. Um, and, and the other point I wanted to bring up before we get into that, though, is you know that that those job gains that were in those sectors like healthcare and restaurants, and those were like restaurants, those were the ones that lost a lot of jobs in the pandemic, and it's good to see them coming back there now. Um, but you're you're also competing against this this idea of manufacturing versus service, and and so service is somehow taking an, an advantage in the in the minds of our workers now too, you know, and and so we're up against that as well. So yeah, it, certainly, um, it it's seen as as a little bit more glamorous and manufacturing. The word in itself um, communicates a a dirty, unskilled uh, labor type of job that's not as attractive uh, to others. But I want to point out that, you know, restaurant um, and hotel management is gaining, yet they don't offer the same level of benefits that our industry or manufacturing as a whole does. When you look at um, healthcare, for instance, the restaurant industry nearly offers no healthcare options. And that's something we need to point out when we're trying to, to recruit and retain when they try to go to a, you know, a service industry that might appear to be more attractive. And that's a, a point um, that you just made there, Teresa, is how you engage your your workforce with, with the story and the communication is probably ever more important. Um, in, in, you know, there's no doubt the economy is doing well, you know, and, and, and things are chugging along. Although uh, I, I was going to touch on, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of softness uh, in, in areas in, in graphic arts, but um, but when that's happening, you know, and and the, the workers have the ability to jump around, and the grass is always greener, right? On the other side, it's not necessarily always greener, and that's that's our job is to point that out, and and uh, we, we have had um, a number of our clients that had lost workers that went to the greener grass, um, maybe even a different different segment of, of manufacturing, and they've come back because the grass wasn't as green. <laughs> and and so that's a, that's a beautiful story that you can have internally once when, when you have an employer or two that has left and come back, you can use them <laughs> as the poster child. But but even if you don't have that, making sure that you you tell this story and get get those people that are thinking um, of of greener grass to think what is really in that and what's what is it here, you know, um, and what do we have and what are we offering and where's our future or your future with us, that type of thing. So. Um, we are, we have started to see, I just mentioned a little bit of, in addition on the manufacturing sectors, but behind the overall, uh, economy, economy and the job market printing itself is, is right in that. And we're starting to see a little bit of softness in, in some of the, the demand and the sales. Um, and so, um, I'm not saying anything more than that but it's just it's just when you're when you have that going it's it's another factor to consider as well making sure that uh, um, you're you're aware of it so um so i just going back to the slide that's up um you mentioned a couple of these trees so remote um remote didn't really exist too much prior to the pandemic uh manufacturing itself doesn't lend itself to remote but the office people at printing plants, that some of that's being done remotely. Um, and, and so there's some creativity in that. Um, AI, that, that was gonna be the big push. I, 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 it, you see AI wasn't in the news too much during the pandemic, but it is everywhere now, right? Um, right. And, and, and I don't know where that's gonna go. I'm not, I'm not the AI guru, but, but I do know um, virtually every industry we, we have in our client base is is talking about some kind of change coming with AI in the near term that's it's going to impact the biggest impact it's going to have is in labor and and so what 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 you need to think about where you need to go with that um, definitely has to be part of the discussion uh, smart plants there was a lot done during the pandemic um, there's there's a lot more being done now and supply chain digitalization, 
all those are are, are geared toward as the as the um, the workforce shrank and, and, and the availability of workers shrank. Um, how could we improve productivity to combat that? That's that's always ongoing. That's not just a a, a pandemic thing, but but we are seeing an emphasis in that coming out of the pandemic like never before. Uh, interestingly enough, though, the productivity gains in in twenty three that they reported on in in, in manufacturing graphic arts didn't dramatically have not dramatically changed since last year, and 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 so um, so is this stuff still to come? I think it is a lot of it. Um, so that's going to have a hopefully a, a positive impact on, on efficiencies. So I just mentioned training or Ryan's question took me there anyway. Um, it, it, you know, there's, there's a, there's a whole focus um, to try to change that mentality of that, what do you call it? The, the dirty grimy job out in the manufacturing plant. That that's not really what's out there. And, and, but that might be in the perception. And so, so there's a big effort I know um, at the print industry across the country they're trying to do this get involved with STEM programs um, yeah, in grade school is, I've heard you know some some of that stuff to, to get pe the young people thinking about these opportunities and as an alternative um, and and training high end skills within your plant right now investing like you've never done before in terms of trying to make sure that you take the young um, unskilled worker and try to make them into the skilled worker of tomorrow rather than the normal progression of how many years that would have taken. There's a there's a, a an emphasis now into really investing in that because they see the the payback that will bring um, into into the efficiencies and the productivity. Um, so uh, re recruiting and retention. I went by that one. Uh, I, well, I've talked about it, but one thing I wanted to mention is culture. Um, culture has always been important, but culture and engagement became so much more important in the pandemic. And I still think that they're critical. Um, and and so just, we can't take our eyes off that ball uh, at all, I think. And, and even though it looks like some of the wages and stuff have, have um wage increase craziness, I'll call it, has leveled off. I, I do think we're still facing the issue of trying to get skilled workers, keep them, um, build your workforce for um, growth for tomorrow. And, and in order to do that, we're gonna need, we're gonna need top level strategies in, in these areas, so. Yeah, it's interesting you say, uh, you know, building an upscale, up, upskilling and training and providing opportunities. And that goes really hand in hand with culture. If you're bringing those opportunities to them for training and um, education and, and uh, opportunity, and you're making it a part of your retention plan, that impacts your culture. Definitely. Well, we're a CPA firm, so this doesn't quite relate, but that's exact. That's exactly what we're running into with our recruiting. We've placed some emphasis on some of these building skill set things, and and we're able to talk about them in the recruiting process, where maybe our competition hasn't. Um, we're getting that second look. We're getting we're getting those people to to walk in the door and, and land here because we're we're no different than than. Um, anybody else we're literally going to find workers as well uh and have the same issue and so i i know that's made a difference for us been able to be able to have a real talk track of what we do and how do we how do we bring those people into that as opposed to uh, somebody hasn't thought about that so well and i would say on the print side all of the sister associations have invested in online training for our membership um, under print university and and several others we call it mid america u and we have members that are using that opportunity to encourage their workers to continue education and then rewarding them with the certificates and uh presenting it during a team meeting and and building it into strategy so you see it happening across the country yeah it's just and you 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 don't fake it you you do real things to invest in the in your employees invest in in your company if you will 
Um, and, and if you can you can demonstrate that uh, you you win because you, you're gonna you're gonna demonstrate that you care and and that this is really a, um, a strategy that you embrace you know so right we have dr Ralph Williams with us um, who also assists the sister associations with our performance indicator reports and the one that just came out um, from the October study is on workplace branding and how that workplace branding impacts recruitment and retention. Um, do they know your company? Do, do they know what you're about and, and what opportunities you have? So I would encourage everyone on the call um, to take a look at those. They are um, being released as we speak. So if you haven't received an email about them, you will in the coming days. Thank you, Dr. Ralph. Yeah, I would just do a, a, a plug here. I mean, uh, for Ralph's reports, um, the 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 trends that he's trying to look at, the finance financial trends and economic trends, and uh, that coupled with this report, I, I look at it as two two go to tools that should be in 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 the uh, management repertoire, if you will, of all. Uh, uh, printing companies and, and and just it just you have to know where things are going and where you, and this industry has been very good about sharing non-confidential information and and it allows you to get a um, a glimpse at what what your your friendly competitors are doing and 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 what what things how things are result the results that are um, um, uh, they're attaining and that type of thing so I just I did see Ralph's name on the attendee list too. So I wanted to, I'm not, he didn't pay me to say any of this, but I just think it's a good report. <laughs> so um, the next slide. Absolutely. I, I, I would agree. Um, certainly while we're here, I want to encourage everyone on the call to participate in those surveys. I know it takes time away from your work day, uh, but it is the way that we can gather information to uh, predict some of these trends and give you insight into what's company coming. So with that said, um, economy and inflation and elections, all of this, Rick, what do you think? Well, if I had any the answers on this, I wouldn't be doing this for a living, but uh, the, the economy, the unknown of the economy, I guarantee you we'll when we talked about this last year, it was it was a, a big concern. I don't, I'm not as concerned about it as it was, but it, personally, I don't, I don't know what Ralph would say about that. But um, um, it, but it's still a wild card. You know, a recession could really change everything in in the labor market, um, and wages and all those other things. But but I I, I don't think that that's where it's headed. But you, you would just have to. Keep an eye on that. Inflation too was was rampant a year ago, um, and the Fed's uh, whether it's the Fed strategy or what's all working together there. Um, again, I'm, I'm not the expert at that, but I do know that it's it's coming down. We are getting significant improvements in that. Um, if that continues, that that could also continue to bring our wage rates, our salary rates. Um, more in line because at that at one point that was that was hard to keep up with and 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 um, so we I, I think we're not going to get rid of the worker shortage issue overnight for sure but maybe the wage pressure itself will will, will mitigate um the election they just throw it out there uh, who knows what's going to happen but that's going to be a uh, 12 more months of fun and and discussions and and but how, how that ends up and where that comes um, that will impact things on the economic standpoint and, and there's a lot going on around the world too that will impact things too so uh, these are global things and most hr people are putting too much focus on those but they're just worth mentioning and we should always be aware of them so well, the good news is um, printing usually does very well um, in an election year historically however when we come out of election year, depending on uh, the results of the election, it definitely impacts the economy, and we have to consider that. Right, right. Yeah, we have a, we have a few printers as clients that are political printers, and they do really well. <laughs> this coming year will be a great year for them. So. 
So, so that's all I had um, Teresa, but I just thought some insights to add to the survey, um, add to the, the a different look at some of the things that are going on. And, and, uh, so. Great, great um, insight. Um, I know that there are several people on the call who may not have had a chance or um, looked at those reports yet. I want to encourage you to get your report access through the sister associations um, across the country. And so they will have um, the opportunity to, to get those to you and talk to you about how that information um, is deciphered and how you can gain insight from the content that's in the, each of those reports. Um, really, I want to open it up for Q&A here or comments. Um, how do you see things going on out there? What information in this webinar um, asks questions? Of, uh, you know, you have questions that say, huh, how do we deal with that? Now's the time if you're an attendee to type them in the Q&A field. Um, and then we have a, a couple of members um, who might be able to add some commentary or thoughts. Ryan or Carl or um, Ken, are you on? There is certainly a lot to a lot to consider, and um, it would be impossible for us to cover everything in those reports in an hour and a half uh, virtual session. So again, there's a lot there for you to decipher, and then you may have additional questions um, or comments. Certainly, uh, there was a comment from Paul Foster earlier asking about hiring trends of those that were younger than 22 years old, um, as well as if there was any data on coaching employees. Um, that is not included in this year's report, but I just added them to the list to consider um, for future. Um, it is certainly something that we've seen across the country. Poaching employees, uh, when you're looking for somebody to recruit to be a pressman and you're considering unskilled labor that you have to train versus recruit from another um organization that has impacted the wage um, as well as um, people losing employees that are jumping from from place to place. Um, there's a there's a comment here in the Q&A talking about a little bit of disappointment in the quantity of responses from the industry um, asking does the low quantity concern us um, in any way as the legitimacy of the findings and results. Uh, my response to that is, yes, we did have um, a drop in about 50 uh, participants this year. Um, we have seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the industry. Some thought that that may have impacted participation. Um, and we had some um, areas that didn't participate as strongly as they had in the past, particularly in the West, um, our California to Colorado group um, didn't have a significant participation this year because of some things happening in their organization. Um, I would look and say, if, if you're in a particular region, those numbers are probably fairly accurate to years past, except for the West. Uh, and your sister associations can get those reports to you to show those, those comparisons. I would also encourage you all to participate um, in the coming year and encourage your colleagues and um, other companies to participate as well. They're only as good as the data that we can collect. Uh, there's another question here in the chat. Uh, we're a company of 75 people and have been averaging four retirements each year over the past three years. And that's significant. Uh, significant for a company of 75 people that you're having to replace them at that rate. But think of those that are one to 25 or 26 to 75 and, and their replacement percentage increases as well. And where are those workers going to come from? Um, is it skilled labor and is it mechanically inclined that you're going to train yourself or 
back to Paul's comment about poaching and driving the wage up. So that's a great, a great question. Um, yeah, that, well, I was just going to add to that too. You know, it's just, that's why I temper some of the positive outlook on the job market reports that come out of the U S uh, labor bureau, but cause there's still things like, like um, what were just raised up there going on in, in the, um, and, and it's tough <laughs> to keep and maintain um, the, the labor force, in, in particularly in the graphic arts industry right now. So. Absolutely. That turnover um, is keeping the churning happening. Um, I, I think you called it the great uh, reassignment. Re, uh, what reshuffle, is it? reshuffle. Reshuffle. Not my term. I, uh, yeah, the great reshuffle. I, I love that term because that's a lot of what we're seeing out there. and. How do you deal with that? Um, another comment from or question here from Ryan: Are other benefits offered to employees inspiring um, retention? We kind of covered that a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Here, yeah, yes. And then a comment from Janie: um, We need for the industry to get involved in their communities to talk about uh, business and education and leaders to let them know about opportunities in our industry. I know several of the sister associations are uh, building advocacy programs to get the word out about what our industry is. Many have put a lot of effort into working with schools and then working with each other across the country, uh, print ed programs and uh, everything from junior achievement to um, secondary schools that have mechanically inclined courses that could be visited with to talk more about um, the printing industry. Sure. It, it's interesting, the comment you made as well, Rick, on um, how young um, they're suggesting we start influencing children. Um, we have some reports that say as young as fourth grade, we need to be influencing them on what their career choices and what their talents and skills and, and goals are to achieve later in life, that it's too late to wait until high school. Thoughts on that? No, I, I, I've read the same stuff and, and I've seen it. Um, it. It's hard to wrap your head around taking time to invest in those kinds of activities, but that is when the thought process are being developed and and uh, the, the, if there's an image that you want to change for the manufacturing sector and, and graphic arts in particular, that's where we, where you have to start, I think. So the industry should be um, leading the charge on some of those efforts. Interesting, because it, it feels like uh, fourth grade, that's, that's <laughs> heck, they, they're concerned about what they're having for lunch, not necessarily what types of classes they're taking. However, it is true. Those that are interested in math or engineering or mechanically inclined, should we be capitalizing on those skills at that age and guiding them into our industry? Some say yes. Yeah, I don't think it's top of mind. I think lunch is always more important at that age. But <laughs> but it, if you can put it in the back of their mind, it, it comes up later, I think. So. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, one other comment here, and that is on the pendulum swinging back on mechanically inclined jobs. Rick, we saw across the country uh, 10, 15 years ago, all of society pushing our young people to go to four-year institutions and get four-year degrees. And that pendulum is now swinging back where we have a four-year graduation rate at less than 25%. A lot of those com kids coming home with a lot of debt and moving back in with their parents and then um, realizing that that wasn't their talent or their skill. But now some of those trade schools um, have closed because of that uh, progression in our country. And so we're trying to rebuild those programs and show them that mechanical jobs are a great opportunity. In fact, I mean, when you look at electricians and plumbers and printers, their wage is, is very good and sometimes higher than the four-year graduate. Thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. And a lot, a lot of the high schools are, are eager to get, get people to come in and, and talk 
about the trades, if you will, um, because of that issue. They're, they're getting that feedback from that. The, the, you know, for years, that was the push. This is your path. Graduate, go to college, four years, and then go, you know, and that that's created this uh, shortage in the manufacturing arena. And, and um, I can speak to it from personal experience. My son graduated just three years ago, and it, uh, um, that's exactly where he landed. He, he, he was thinking, oh, I have to go to college, and, but he didn't. He, he went to trade school, and, and the, the wages he's making and the opportunities he's seeing compared to his friends who went to college, he's making more money than they are, and he's got zero debt. It was so, um, it, it's 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 an opportunity, and it's it's one that again, um, the messaging is changing, the trade associations, the high schools, all those things. It's definitely changing, but it it it, it had been a lot of years going the other way, so it's going to take a little while for that momentum to change and actually have results. So, yeah. excellent comment. Um, on this last slide, I've added my contact information as well as Rick's. This um, will be provided as a PDF to the sister associations, um, so you can access it through them. Uh, many of them will provide it to you if you attended today. Uh, we encourage you to continue to give questions and comments um, and be a part of the be a part of the narrative. Uh, the survey really belongs to the industry. And so suggestions for questions and other things we should be measuring are really taken seriously and to heart. And we encourage you to do that. Uh, Rick, any last thoughts before we end the program? No, thank you. Looks like we might have one more. Uh, oh, one more comment. And that is just, thank you so much. Very helpful. Um, we'll get this information out to you and look forward to having you participate in the future. Thank you. Thank you.